Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to Sniper Elite 4 where today we will be discussing 7 things that Sniper Elite 4 did better than 5. So without further ado, let's get into this. First things first, let us address the elephant in the room. Sniper Elite 4's map design was much, much better than Sniper Elite 5's is. Don't get me wrong, Sniper Elite 5's maps aren't bad by any means and they do have some excellent sections. The Abbey on the third level and the Gun Battery on Landing Force are both good examples of this. But on the whole, Sniper Elite 4's maps were far superior. The Sniper Elite 5 team, during development, made a big fanfare of how they were using telegrammetry and other such wizardry to make all the locations in Sniper Elite 5 as realistic as possible, and that, I believe, is where the issues arrive. Short of just porting a laser quest arena into your game, copy-pasting real-world locations into your game does not, did not, and will not make entertaining levels. Sansolini, the first level of Sniper Elite 4 is a brilliant level because it clearly isn't a real place. It looks realistic, but it is first and foremost designed to be a good level, and then it was made to look realistic afterwards, which is how it should be done. Atlantic Wall, the first level of Sniper Elite 5, is row upon row of hedges and fences. This is very realistic to what a load of fields would actually be like. But as anyone who's played Atlantic Wall knows, this does not make a fun level at all. Admittedly, Atlantic Wall, and all the levels of Sniper Elite 5 for that matter, do have good, fun, clearly designed for a video game sections, but these seem to have been thrown on after the level has been finished in a desperate attempt to make it fun. These areas seem either forced and completely jarring to the rest of the map, which is achingly no boringly realistic, or they just act as near-linear run-and-gun sections that make me feel like I'm playing a shooter on the Xbox 360. Because Sniper Elite 4 had less realistic geography on the whole, these obviously designed for video game spaces could be implemented in the wider level more seamlessly, which made the levels on the whole a lot more fun. As a side note whilst we're here, another issue with Sniper Elite 5's maps is that the population of the enemies is awful. Oftentimes you are far too overpopulated, which makes stealth far more difficult, and then, when you are inevitably discovered, you have a preposterous number of enemies to dispose of. Then reinforcements will arrive, which makes your task harder. This, I believe, is deliberate. It makes you pull out your submachine gun without a moment's hesitation, which is precisely what Rebellion wants, as it opens the floodgates to the younger, more aggressive gamers of today, who are so pumped up on E-numbers, monster energy and a vitamin D deficiency, that they won't accept anything but complete carnage, even in a so-called tactical shooter that Sniper Elite 5 insists it is. Less often, but much worse, is the discovery of an area that has too few enemies. The construction site in Guernsey is a good example of this. Instead of a difficult firefight that it should be, you'll find a small handful of the Reich's least qualified, who go about their job with the efficiency of a dead rabbit. I've always thought that the amount of people guarding this site in Sniper Elite 5 has been ridiculously low, and it's a shame because this is part of the game that has brilliant map design. Second on our list, we have armoured vehicles, or more specifically, taking down armoured vehicles. In Sniper Elite 4, there were two ways of destroying a vehicle. You could shoot the driver of the vehicle through the driver's slot, which was clearly shown to the player as it glowed red as a vehicle weak point when the vehicle was tagged, and then you'd run up to a vehicle afterwards, plant a satchel charge on it, and then make like a Freddo and hop it. Additionally, one satchel charge would always destroy a vehicle, no matter how much damage it had already taken or what vehicle it was. Otherwise, you could place a landmine, which would destroy the vehicle, or at the very least immobilise it, allowing the player to execute the tried and tested satchel charge manoeuvre. However, in Sniper Elite 5, 
the player is instructed merely to spam AP rounds into an ambiguously marked zone at the back of a tank or on the sides of a 222, like some sort of Call of Duty enough bullets takes down anything eventually mentality. This is vulgar, repetitive, ridiculous, repetitive, remarkably un-British, which is awful, especially if you are British, and worst of all, it's repetitive. Or you could just shoot through the driver and gunner slots like in Sniper Elite 4, but the game doesn't tell you this, and it's a really evil angle. Additionally, a satchel charge can be used on a mobile but undamaged vehicles, where it will not actually destroy the vehicle, which is really dumb, especially as you only have a very limited amount of satchel charges, unlike the infinite amount of satchel charges you had in fall. Third on this list, we have landmines and rocks, which were perfect in 4, only to be ruined in 5. In Sniper Elite 4, you had S mines, which are a powerful anti-infantry device, which would be planted before shooting up from the ground and exploding when they are activated. They had quite a large activation radius and a very, very large explosion radius, which made them perfect for dispatching large amounts of infantry. You also had Teller Mines, which had a small activation radius and a small blast radius, but very high damage, and they were perfect for dealing with vehicles, especially when coupled with the even greater explosive power of TNT. And finally, you had Trip Mines, where you plant a mine and then lay a tripwire from it, which would detonate the mine when it was touched. They had an explosion radius that sat in between that of the other two mines, but they only really had the damage to deal with infantry. Trip mines may have been less effective than S mines, but they allowed a skilled player to be much more creative, especially due to the fact that you could chain together multiple trip mines, which allowed you to use them to trap entire fields and other large areas, something you could never have done with the other two mines. Telemines were kept for Sniper Elite 5 as a single player, but they were simplified down to a one-size-fits-all anti-infantry and anti-vehicle mine to appeal to Sniper Elite 5's more moronic intended fanbase. To complement the results of this 2008 level decision, Rebellion introduced shoe mines, which, along with the decoy and the flint and steel, is the dumbest item in Sniper Elite history. Shoe mines were designed as a non-lethal mine, which is a stupidly unrealistic and b pointless, as most players don't bother with Sniper Elite 5's non-lethality mechanics anyway. The worst bit is that S mines do make an appearance in Sniper Elite 5's multiplayer, where their alternative mode is the trip mine. This also means that the S and trip mines now lose their alternative modes which both delayed the detonation of the mine in order to allow more troops into the blast radius before the thing went off. The only marketable improvement for mines in Sniper Elite 5 was Rebellion switching the alternative mode of the telemine from the delayed detonation, which was quite useful for destroying convoys, which aren't really in Sniper Elite 5, and were quite rare in 4, and replacing it with a mode where the mine only detonates when a heavy enemy or a vehicle goes over it meaning that mine and TNT combo you'd set up for a tank won't be triggered by a hapless infantry wobbling over it. The issue with rocks is simple. Rocks were removed from the game and replaced with bottles, which are limited in number. Limiting distraction tools like this serves no purpose. Rocks have been a staple part of the series since its inception, and they've remained identically throughout all games excluding 5. I think that removing rocks and replacing them with functionally identical but numerically limited bottles is effectively dissuading the use of tactical thinking and, like most of the other stuff in Sniper Elite 5, is incentivizing submachine gun focused gameplay. Fourth on the list we have the environmental variety that Sniper Elite 4 had. Sniper Elite 4's maps were set in beautiful villages, in monasteries, in top secret military coastal facilities, in totalitarian bunkers and snowy tundra, in docks at night and in the snow, in German towns, Italian universities and even on viaducts. Sniper Elite 5, on the other hand, seems to spend most of its time in French fields, which, if I'm being honest, aren't nearly as good as some other nations' fields. The entirety of Sniper Elite 5 just seems green, 
In fact, the only levels in the base game that aren't set in a field or a forest or anything like that are War Factory and Rubble and Ruin, and they're both set in towns. Everything in Sniper Elite 5 is so achingly green and planty, whereas Sniper Elite 4 had tons of interesting locations, both natural and non-natural. Overall, Sniper Elite 4, in my opinion, had a much better direction in terms of how levels looked, and Sniper Elite 5, for the most part, failed to capture that magic. Next up, we have Duty Rosters. Duty Rosters were a very interesting collectible. Officers would often carry them, and picking them up would automatically binocular tag every single man of another squad nearby. This was incredibly useful, as you would automatically have everyone tagged before entering an area. This didn't happen in Authentic, of course, where players would actually have to read the duty roster and work out roughly where the guards would be and when, which was more fun, and also something that wouldn't happen today. But duty rosters also had a profound effect on gameplay. Now you had to prioritise killing the officer first, even though he is easily the least dangerous enemy. Scarier enemies like the Spotter and the Support Jaeger now have to be killed later because you couldn't possibly risk the officer running away and you losing your precious duty roster. This makes Sniper Elite 4 the only video game I've ever played where it is prudent to prioritise killing the weakest enemy of the squad first and then killing the biggest ones later, which is an incredibly innovative way of switching up the combat loop and making players think. The Sniper Elite 5 team must have disagreed, however, as they completely removed duty rosters, which is ridiculous. Even if they'd made it so they didn't tag enemies and you'd just have to read the thing, that would have been nice, but they just decided to ruin it instead. They could have even put that intel stuff that you gather and it appears on your map on duty rosters, but they couldn't be bothered. What a missed opportunity. Next up, we have the sheer freedom of movement that Sniper Elite 4's level design allowed you. I've just realised this is another section of this video that's about level design, but you know, that says a lot, right? Sniper Elite 4 featured very few invisible walls or inaccessible places, and it was greatly appreciated, and it really made the maps feel as open and as non-linear as they were. Sniper Elite 5, on the other hand, is ruined by barricades and invisible walls and the like as they crop up everywhere and seem to serve the sole purpose of blocking the player's entry into spaces that look accessible. This happens either to just flat up block you from entering an area, or to force you into taking a more dangerous route around where you'll encounter multiple enemies. This of course is really dumb in a game that prides itself on complete sniping freedom. It wasn't like this in Sniper Elite 4, it wasn't even like this in Sniper Elite 3, so why it is like this now will forever be a mystery to me. And finally we have friendly versus enemy AI battles, which were a feature I really liked in Sniper Elite 4. There were three in the campaign, one in Batanti Village, which was the best one, one in GOV Fiorini, and then this weird case in a Brunza monastery where the partisans would arrive to defend Castle Hill once you've cleared it out, which doesn't count as they didn't really do any fighting. These battles were safe spaces where you could just go loud with your submachine gun, have fun and blow stuff up. Fighting alongside AI friendly, as useless as they were, was super cool. You could either join up with the partisans and fight alongside them, hitting the Germans head on, or use them as a distraction whilst you snipe the Germans from behind, trapping them between you and the partisans. It's a real pity these battles weren't in Sniper Elite 5. Can you imagine taking the first town in Liberation with help from a squad of US Rangers? That would be so much fun. Instead, friendly AI in Sniper Elite 5 stand around twiddling their thumbs and listlessly informing you of your information on upcoming objectives. Thank you everyone for watching the video. Remember to like, subscribe and comment, it costs you nothing and it's a great way to help out the channel. Stay safe and goodbye.